Each one of us has been given life by Allah. And every single one of us, that life is going to be taken away by the same Allah. So he who gave you the life is going to take it away. Before you were born, where were you? You were where Allah wanted you to be. And during this life, Allah gives us certain freedoms within limits, within his power. And Allah wants us to do what he has instructed us to do. And after a short period of time, he will take us away. In the interim, there are two main things that we need to fulfill. Number one is recognizing the one who gave you the life and the one who's going to take it away. Same deity. To recognize he who gave you the life is one of the most important reasons for you to have been given the life. I was given life, I came onto earth. Why? Allah wants me to recognize Him, to worship Him alone. He says it in the Quran. I have not created mankind or jinn kind except so that they worship me. And many of the young people when they read that verse, they don't understand that it actually means except that they lead their entire lives according to what I have ordained. That's what it means. Which means you're sitting, you're standing, you're moving, you're drinking, you're eating, you're dealings. Everything should be as per what Allah has instructed and allowed and permitted. That's what is meant by worshipping Allah. But in order to be able to worship Allah correctly, you need definitely to recognize Him. You need to know who He is. He is the one who gave you the life. A friend of mine, this morning in the early hours of the morning, his wife gave birth. MashaAllah. The excitement of that birth. We make a dua, we congratulate, there is happiness and there is concern also. What is the concern? The child should be healthy, the child should be good, the child should be obedient, the child should not be a means of our downfall, the child should not embarrass us, the child should this, the child should that. But as we grow older, we all become independent, right? So we start doing things that embarrass our parents. We do things that embarrass ourselves, subhanAllah. We forget Allah in the process. We leave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the equation. And what has happened sometimes in some people's lives is Allah blesses them by allowing them to come back because of a reminder, because of something, because of guidance that was served to them by Allah. So when you have drifted astray for some reason due to you forgetting the power of Allah and who Allah is and the fact that He is in total control of your life and the fact that He can take it away, Also this morning in the city of Leicester, I received a message of a friend's child who, or a friend's grandchild, who passed away in a car accident last night. Healthy young man, what happened? Perhaps, probably lost control of the vehicle and hit into a pillar or a tree, something of that nature, passed away. The life in the hands of Allah, may Allah grant him Jannah and make it easy for his parents. May Allah grant every one of our marhumin and the deceased Jannatul Firdaus. But my brothers and sisters, have mercy on your parents. Have mercy on your parents. Because Allah instructed you to have mercy on your parents. How? Number one, by making dua for them. Number two, part of that would be, and we are Muslimin, so we have to obey Allah's instruction, but by being kind to them. Number three is by not doing something that would embarrass them, subhanallah. And if they were to instruct you to do something that would embarrass you as a Muslim, you excuse yourself. If you have parents who are not Muslim, family members who are not Muslim, etc., don't be harsh. Be kind. You still have to be kind. They are your family members. They are your parents. Your brothers and sisters were chosen by Allah for you, not by you. Your parents were chosen by Allah for you, not by you. 
So you have to be kind, you have to be courteous, you have to be helpful, you have to be easy going, you have to know they may not think the way you think, but remember to be courteous and kind is something that is your duty. If you were to make them such that their lives become a misery due to your action, you have paid a disservice to them. Don't do that. No matter what we do in our lives, don't embarrass your parents. Very important point. Sometimes if they are wrong, you may want to seek guidance for yourself and for them. And those of us who are parents, learn to be easy going. Don't be too harsh and hard on your children. In this day and age, the harshness does not work. Allah says in the Quran to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكِ if you were harsh and hard-hearted, the people from around you would have dispersed. They wouldn't even have listened to you. So if that is a message to Rasulullah who did not really need the message because Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, you are upon the highest level of character and conduct. He did not need that message, but Allah sent it to him for you and I to learn a lesson. Your character, your conduct, don't be harsh and hard with those around you or they will disperse. Every other day I receive emails of people who say I want to leave home because my folks are being harsh and hard and they are not listening. Today I received an email of someone saying that when I want to fulfill salah, my mother laughs at me. When I want to do things correctly and I want to obey Allah's instruction just by going to the masjid, they scoff at me. Subhanallah, what do you want me to say now? What should I say? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and grant us goodness. So as much as we need to be kind and good to our parents and not make them embarrassed by our actions, parents, we also need to be sensitive regarding how we choose to bring up those children. Communication is something that is lacking so much in today's society. Not because technology is not advanced, but because we have not put aside technology the moment we step into the home. That's the problem. We have the latest phones. If I ask you how many of you have one of the S series Samsung or an iPhone, one of the new, you know, uh, phones, mashallah, many of you might be recording this right now as I can see. So that's technology. But remember when you go into your home, when you get into your, your, the territory where your family is, learn to set limits with your mobile devices. If you don't, I promise you, what was the point? What's the point of having family? You have never spent time with them. You have never sat with them. They don't know the, your problems and you don't know their problems. And when you know problems, you don't help. You make it difficult. I've seen parents whom, because of sins they are committing themselves, they become impatient. So when the child says, I need help, I want to marry this person. And the father starts blowing his top such that it's totally out of this world but that father himself sometimes is involved in adultery it has happened many occasions the father himself or the mother is involved in something unacceptable but when the child wants to do something acceptable we won't want to do it so then how do you want to be protected from the embarrassment that we are talking about today may Allah make it easy for every one of us it's a balance as much as we have to respect our folks and our family members, we also ask them to respect us, to fulfill our rights. And that's why when it comes to wives and women, the Quran says, They have rights just like the rights they have to deliver as well. Rights for them and rights that they need to fulfill. Just like the husband has rights, the wife has rights. That's what the Quran says. It's not one-way traffic. It's two-way traffic. You need to respect each other. Each other. But that is now connected to the first duty that we have, and that is the link we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second duty, and that's what I want to talk about here more, is the relationship we have with one another. <coughs> one another. When Allah made me, He wants me to recognize Him. Right? That's what we said at the beginning. And the second thing, He wants me to recognize everything else He has made. 
Subhanallah. A lot of us fail in this. When Allah made me, guess what? He made you too. Subhanallah. When Allah made us as humans, guess what? In fact, before I get to human beings, when Allah made a race, He made another race as well, another few races. And that term race, I've never understood it in the English language because it always seems when they say, what race? I say, no, it's not a hundred meter race. We're talking of race as in racial lines. And it's not a race. We're not in a competition. So for some reason, that word itself has a problem in it, if you get what I'm saying. We're not in a race. No one's going to win the race. No. Different colors. Allah's made. Different languages. You can speak Bengali. You can speak Pakistani, Urdu. You can speak Gujarati. You can speak Farsi. You can speak French. But you are going to communicate with a lot of people with that language. But I might not speak your language. Guess what? It doesn't make you any inferior, nor does it make your language any inferior. The fact that English is across the globe today, actually in the eyes of Allah, doesn't make it superior at all. If anything, perhaps we would know as Muslimin that Arabic is the language of the Quran, the language of the Nabi ﷺ. Subhanallah, it has superiority in that sense, definitely. If you don't recognize the fact that Allah has made with you others, you have a problem. Those others are as important as you are. Every one of us feels important. If we were to dish out hot biryani today and we were all hungry, we would all want to have a good plate. Where is he or she who waits to serve the elderly and others before he goes in? Why? Because he's recognized that Allah made these people as well. When you see the disabled in a queue, for you to be able to let them go with an honor and dignity is a sign you've recognized Allah. When you see the women and the elderly and you serve them for the sake of Allah with respect and let them perhaps get to the front of such a queue before you, it is a sign that you've recognized Allah. Some of the young people would only do that if she was quite pretty. <laughs> May Allah safeguard us. Clean your intention. You do it when they're old, you do it when they... So, that's it. If you see anyone in help, Allah, sorry, needing help, Allah says if you were to help them, you would get closer to Allah. When you see someone sick and ill, if you were to visit them genuinely, to make a dua for them, Allah says you will find Allah. Why? Because it proves what we're saying. Your duty is to recognize what Allah made with you, with you, together with you. So uh, with me, Allah made you. With us, Allah made others. But they're all important. Give them that due. I love myself. I need to love you too. That's when I'm a winner. But I love myself and I hate you. I've lost. Allah made you. You may be different from me. The Prophet ﷺ had people who disagreed with him completely. He always prayed for them. He made dua for them. He tried with them. He continued trying with them. That was Rasulullah wasallam. So thereafter, Allah has made with humankind other creatures. What are the creatures? Those creatures that may benefit us and those that may not benefit us and those that may harm us. Allah made all of that. What has all that done for you? Has it brought you closer to Allah? If the answer is yes, you're a winner. If the answer is no, well, you will learn as time passes. When you see, for example, a dog or a cat or a pig or a lizard or a spider or a, or a bird or a fish or any other animal or an insect, a reptile, no matter what it is, what do you think of? Man naturally looks at the animal or the creature of Allah and has something preconceived already. You see a snake, hit it. It's preconceived, right? You see spiders, spray something, make sure they're gone. That's what man thinks. You see birds, enjoy them, take a picture, put it up on Instagram. MashaAllah, especially the colorful ones. That's what man thinks. 
You see a crocodile, you run away. Why? That's man. Allah has kept within you an understanding, but that understanding is at times contaminated by humankind. In Islam, we don't just go around harming animals. If something is about to harm you, you save yourself. Definitely. But you don't go out to look for it in its own habitat and start destroying it. The world is only learning that now. But Muslims were taught that a long time back. Preserve the animals, preserve this and preservation of what not. So many different things. Endangered species and all those words that have come about now. The concern of the globe, it's very recent. But with Islam, we've been taught this from the beginning. You don't just go out in a destructive way and start, uh, you know, looking for snake holes and killing the snakes in their own habitat. No. But if, the, if it comes to you and wants to harm you and attack you, you have every right to save yourself. Even if it means the snake lost its life. So we respect not just other human beings. We respect other creatures of Allah. Why? Because... The same creator has made them. That's the reason. If Allah didn't want, he wouldn't have made those creatures. He's powerful. He made them because he wants to test you and I. How long are you going to live on earth for? How long? 70 years. If you are above 70, you are living on bonus. MashaAllah, Allah has given you a bonus. And if you get into 70, tell yourself, my life is coming to an end. Tell yourself, what did you do? Don't be depressed. Have hope in the mercy of Allah and prepare for the meeting with Allah. Two things. How do you prepare for the meeting with Allah? Engage in lots of sujood and istighfar. Find your head in prostration. That's the closest you could ever be to Allah. And seek the forgiveness of Allah. He hears you. He listens. He knows. He answers. He will hold that statement for you on the day of judgment he will hold it when you seek the forgiveness of Allah it never goes to waste never it is an acknowledgement that oh Allah my neck is in your hands Allahu Akbar it's a dua of the Prophet oh Allah you are in total control of us you have us by the neck you can do what you want with us if Allah wants anything can happen anywhere may Allah bless those who are struggling with solutions to their struggles. May Allah grant ease to our brothers and sisters in Indonesia who are struggling with the earthquakes that are hitting them right now as we speak. I'm sure nearly all of us have seen the clip of the Imam who remained in Salah and the ground was shaking. I don't know what we would do. The ground was shaking. And he remained in Salah. Allahu Akbar. They asked him later on, what happened? Were you not afraid? He says, I was ready to meet Allah. And the best way to meet him would have been in the condition of Salah. It was not wrong for him to break the Salah and run. It is permissible. In fact, it is encouraged. When you see loss of life or something dangerous, the the prohibition of allowing life to be lost is greater than you having broken your salah. So you break your salah. And you're supposed to go. So much so that in the books of fiqh, it actually says, if there is a blind man that you notice with the corner of your eye about to fall into a pit, you break your salah and you save the man. That's known. But if Someone has reached at a new level where it's not someone else's harm, it's my own. So if, if there was life to be saved, we would have told that Imam, you are wrong. But it was his own life. If he's got to a stage where he surrendered to Allah, oh Allah, you want to take me? If I am going to go, nothing's going to change it. But I'd rather go in Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us the ability. Before I move on to the next point, you see that point of passing away in Salah, my beloved youth who are here today. Wouldn't you love to pass away in the condition of sujood? When the hadith says, Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu li rabbihi wa huwa sajid. The closest that a slave could be to Allah 
is when he is in sajda, when he is in prostration. We'd love to pass away in that condition. But we have one major problem. What's the problem? We don't even read salah. We don't even read salah. And I remember a young boy, some of you might have heard this from me before, who says, make dua, I pass away in salah. I said, but brother, do you even read salah? He says, well, not really. I said, so then how do you want to die in salah? He said, no, if Allah accepts that dua, then, you know, if I don't read salah right now, it's okay. One day when I read it, he'll take me. I said, oh, we have no guarantee. The hadith says, you die the way you lived and you will be resurrected the way you die. That's what the hadith says. So you die the way you lived. If you lived in a bad way, Allah says, don't worry, I used, there is still hope for you. For as long as you turn quickly to Allah, to commit a sin is human. Because none of us have ever committed a sin out of defiance of Allah. But we've only committed sin out of the weakness of our human nature. That's Iman. Do you want to know if you're a mu'min? You can ask yourself. You want to know if you're a believer? Ask yourself, when I've committed a sin, is it because of the weakness of my human nature? Or is it because I want to defy Allah? It's never the latter. Never. No one defies Allah. From the believers, even those on drugs and whatever else, it's terrible. May Allah grant us all savior. And I know many brilliant people, they have a weakness, they have an addiction, whether it's pornography, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's gambling, so many other, adultery sometimes, people are addicted. They need to get rid of that habit. They need to cut it down. They need to cut it out. And how will you help yourself? By establishing your five prayers. That is the first step. Every Jumu'ah, every single Jumu'ah, every Friday, every time you enter the masjid, even if you don't know the Arabic language, you hear the verses right at the end of the khutbah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِيْتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِيِ يَعِيبُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ Do you not hear that? What does it mean to you? Young guys will say it means the end of the khutbah. <laughs> it actually is so powerful. That's why it's repeated so many times. Allah is instructing you to be just. How many of us are just? The number is diminishing. Right? Allah instructs you to be kind. How many of us are kind? The number is becoming less. Every Jum'ah, Allah is instructing you to be just. Allah is instructing you to be kind. Allah is instructing you to give your relatives and others, those in need, give. How many of us are giving? It's becoming less and less. And Allah prohibits you from immorality. Every Jum'ah, Allah is saying, watch out, don't commit adultery. Every Jum'ah, watch out, don't watch pornography. Every Jum'ah, watch out, be moral. Lift up your values, your morals. Don't be vulgar. That's what it means, fahsha. Fahsha is all immorality. Even if it's abuse by the tongue, by the mouth. Anything immoral, Allah says, cut it out. When? Every Friday. If you only heard that one verse every Friday, it was sufficient to change your life. If I got up and just read that verse and walked away, it was enough to save your life and mine. The problem is, for us, it means, hey, I can go back to my football. <coughs> That's what it means. A lot of people sit outside during Jumu'ah. And when they hear, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli, they quickly run inside. Because they know now it's about to time, it's about to start the salah. Munkar, munkar is evil, anything evil. Allah says, whatever is evil, quit it, cut it. al bari transgression. Allah says, don't transgress, don't commit sin, cut it out. What a powerful verse. So this is why Allah says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Indeed, salah, salah has the capacity to stop you from immorality and evil. If you fulfill your five daily salah and you do it properly and correctly, it will slowly but surely help you to cut back the immoral behavior and the immoral words and that which is evil. Because the Quran says it. 
fulfill your salah correctly and you will find definitely that it is going to help you quit your bad habits. Therefore, I start off by saying, my brothers, my sisters, establish your five daily prayers. Come what may, even if it means you start off with your farad alone. That's not my aim. My aim is to go beyond that. But I, but I start off with that. I start off with that. I start off with five daily salah. Is that a promise, inshallah? inshallah. That was nice and loud, mashallah. inshallah. Brothers and sisters of Shah Jalal in Burnley, we want to see Salat al Isha tonight with the same crowd. Amen. Then there is success. There is success. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us all. Amen. So we respect each other, we respect the creatures of Allah. Like I said at the beginning, Allah wants us to recognize Him and Allah wants us to recognize everything else that He has made. Because if my relation is good with you, it's because, it should be primarily because you were also made by Allah. As much as I feel important, I need to give you the importance. To feel important is a natural feeling. But to give importance to others is something your iman will help you to build. And to give importance to those who are different from you without a reason shows that you are even closer to Allah. I always say, when you are kind to a person who you are going to benefit from, sometimes your intention might be contaminated. But when you are kind to a person whom you don't know, you may never know, and you, you are not expecting any benefit from, in that case, you are expecting the benefit from Allah. If I am good to you because I think you are a big man, my intention is already lost. I am good to you because I think you are a big man. If I am good to someone because I think she is a pretty woman, my intention is gone. It's lost. But when I'm good to you because I know you're a beloved creature of Allah, now my intention is a little bit better. It's heading in the right direction. When I help you because I just want to please Allah, when I care for you, when I don't speak bad about you, because I know if I did that, I would displease Allah, then my connection with Allah is strong. We don't mind speaking bad about each other, any small thing. And the phone has made it easier. Internet, you know, Twitter. <clears throat> when I heard that word the first time many years back, I was wondering what it was. I didn't know. And I thought, what a name, what a word. <clears throat> they call them twits. May Allah protect us. <laughs> but it became that everyone's a twit. I mean, everyone tweets, don't they? Twitter. Allahu Akbar. And we have actually started tweeting things that the angels will hold for us or against us on the day of judgment. We don't realize the power of social media. Social media has allowed us to multiply the sin of the sin that we're going to be committing. Because if I told you in the past about someone's evil, I was backbiting. I could come back to you and say, brother, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I sorted it out, right? Today you forward a WhatsApp message in a split second. You don't know how many million it has already reached. To reverse that is semi-impossible. And that thing carries on going. It keeps on going. A year later, it will come back. Someone else will forward it to you. And you say, oh, I don't even know how this came. I started it. That's why we say be careful. As much as the powers of the world today claim that they have a button that can destroy another nation, we have buttons on our phones that can destroy us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Now I want to come to the one powerful message that I have for you this afternoon. My brothers, my sisters, take a look at the condition of your heart. Your heart. Does it have in it jealousy, envy, hatred, ill feeling, selfishness? If it does, deal with it. If you purify your heart, you become a beautiful family that will stand up for one another. But when your heart is impure, you won't get anywhere. When you have a problem with someone, 
go back to the sunnah as to how to deal with it. I was speaking to some brothers earlier and I was saying, sometimes the scholars, the ulama, the people whom we look up to, because the generations have passed, sometimes we don't realize and they don't realize that they need help too to clean their hearts. The amount of hatred I've seen in my travels across the globe among people who are supposed to be scholarly. They have large followings. They have people who look up to them. But they themselves have not yet dealt with their own issues in their hearts. There's still hatred, ill feeling, jealousy, selfishness, love of oneself. These are qualities that can affect the best from amongst us. When I say love of oneself, I'm talking about giving yourself preference over others. There's something called husnudvan. Husnudvan means to think good of another person. We think bad of others. The minute you see a person walking down the, the, the road, the, the worst thought comes in a lot of our minds. Because we need help. So if that is the condition of the leaders, what do you think will be the condition of those who are being led? Where are we going? And the only reason I'm saying this is because this issue, nobody is saved from. None of us here can say, I have a pure heart, not even myself. But we are trying to purify our hearts and become better as the days pass. I want today to be better than yesterday. And I want tomorrow to be better than today. And I'm moving towards Allah. But if I think about myself alone, and if I think to myself, you know what, I am the person. These others are bad. What he intended was wrong. What happens? I, I won't be able to solve the problems of the ummah. If I have an issue with you and I'm a leader, I should call you in private and I should discuss the matter instead of making a public announcement to degrade and, dis and, and drop someone else. But that's what we're doing. So if that is the case and that is what's happening, every single leader that we have amongst the Muslims has someone somehow somewhere who has spoken evil about them. As a result of that, the masses have lost respect of all our leaders. That's where we've gotten. When you mention someone's name, they say, but didn't you hear of X, Y, Z? They mention a negative thing, rule him out. You mention another person's name, rule him out. You name me one of our leaders, scholars, or our, the leaders of our society, name me one who has not a blemish next to their names. Zero. I don't know of one. I don't. When I say blemish, I mean someone else has been speaking about them something bad, negative. You know why this is happening? We are too impatient. We love to see the downfall of others. It's a sickness of the heart. When a Muslim does well in business, we suddenly have the worst thoughts of him. We become jealous. When someone gets a promotion, they get a new job. Someone buys a new car. Why do we get jealous of them? What did they steal of yours? It's a sickness of the heart. That's the reason why we're failing as an ummah. Subhanallah. We want an increase in salary, but we don't want it for the imam in the masjid, for, for example. Why? If he gets an increase, he says, no, that imam is greedy. Subhanallah. But you have 10 times his salary and there's nothing. Oh, you're not greedy, right? I'm working hard for it. He just has to lead the salah. Subhanallah. What, what do you think? The imams, their work is much more difficult than the rest of us. And they don't get appreciated. I was once sitting at a seminar of imams and we were talking about some of these issues. And very interestingly, one of the scholars raised a point and he says, you know, every time you go to places, you find the imam is the lowest paid and the job, the work expected from him is the biggest. And the, the type of people who shove instruction down his throat, <laughs> it's shocking. And on top of that, they keep telling you, but you're working for Allah. Allahu Akbar. Look at how blackmail is called religious blackmail. <laughs> religious blackmail. You're working for Allah. 
the most successful communities that I've come across in my travels are those whom the Imam is better paid than the doctors outside. It's the only time because then he, he can say what he wants. He, he is the leader. He doesn't need to please this one and that one. He needs to please Allah because what he has enough. But the minute it's something meager, the poor Imam, even the children who come and say, I'm going to tell my father he'll fix you up. <laughs> I swear. That's what's happening. Why? There's no respect left. So one of the scholars said, well, you know what? In all honesty, Allah will give them in return on the day of Qiyamah. You know the Mu'addin in the Masajid, the one who calls out for Adhan. In a lot of cases, the payment is meager. Some people say you're not allowed to take a salary for this. I don't know the situation here. I'm talking about my own country. So they say you're not allowed to take and whatever, whatever. You know what Allah tells them? nasi The most conspicuous people in rank on the day of judgment will be the Mu'addins. They will have the longest necks, which means you just have to look back, you see all the Mu'addins faces. SubhanAllah. In fact, it's wrong for me to say you have to look back. We'll probably be looking forward, they'll be in front of us. Why? Because when a Mu'addin says, Everyone who walks in, the full reward of that salah goes to the one man as well. Full reward. Beautify your adhan. If anyone comes to the masjid with a beautiful adhan because they heard a lovely adhan, you get the full reward of any ibadah they engaged in when they walked into the masjid. That's why Allah says, you will get done, we will give you. So the point today that I'd like to remind myself and yourselves with is to clean the heart, learn to love each other. If you have a problem with someone, deal with it personally with them like this. You don't have to go to the rest of the world and start announcing things. That's the wrong way of doing things. Don't be jealous. Don't be envious. Don't have hatred. Don't speak without sound knowledge. If you have goodness, teach it. If you don't, remain silent. Because the Prophet says, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir, falyakul khayran aw liyasmut. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, if you really believe in Allah and the last day, last day meaning you believe that there is a day coming when there will be reckoning happening. I am accountable for my deeds. If you believe in Allah and the last day, what should you do? The hadith says, either say that which is good and beneficial or keep quiet. That's my message. Say that which is beneficial or good, keep quiet. And when we say, say that which is beneficial or good, it includes typing, writing, forwarding, messaging, all of that is included. Say what, what is good or keep quiet. When you think before you speak, you are more conscious of Allah. Most of us, more than 90% of us, most of the time, we don't think. We just say what we have to, done. We don't think about what we are saying and how we are saying it. We don't even choose good words when the hadith speaks about watching your tongue. We walk into the house and we just say what we want. Subhanallah. Yesterday we had an event in Blackburn. Some of you might have been there. I, I actually see some faces of some of the people and I recognize them, mashallah. Uh, there was a little point. The brother was calling out someone whose car was parked wrongly. And he made a good announcement. He said, whoever's car this is, you know, and I said, brother, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. There's a way of saying things. There's a way of saying things. So then I, I said, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect. No, I'm very far from it. But I'm just giving an example of how if you think you can come up with a good, good way of saying things. Instead of saying something so abruptly in a way that the person feels embarrassed. So I said, you know, mashallah, we all make mistakes. It's not we are human. But to stay or to, to you know, be, uh, to stay on that mistake is what is wrong. But inshallah, if you get up, Allah will bless you, grant you goodness, open your doors. You get barakah in your car. May Allah bless you, your vehicle, your family, your this, your that. And you know what? In no time, the car was moved. 
right at the end, it was taqdeed that we were dishing out some prizes for some people. And one was missing. So what we decided to do is that one, we gave it to the person whose car was parked wrong. <laughs> Can I tell you why? People ask me, why did you do that? You're rewarding sin. No, I'm not rewarding sin. I'm rewarding the bravery and the courage to get up and admit and walk out and solve your problem and come back. That's what we're rewarding. If I told you right now, guys, the Rolls Royce parked out there is parked wrongly. Please can the brother get up and go and move his car and don't do it again. I mean, for a rich man to get up and start thinking my Rolls Royce, he'll sit, he'll wait. In a lot of cases, you say, ah, they can see. And when, when we finish Salah, the only time he's going to give his son the key and say, son, move the Rolls Royce. <laughs> Say, Dad, next week we can park in the same place. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah grant us goodness. Really, I pray that Allah benefit me from what I've said. And I pray that Allah benefit all of us. Uh, we'd like to increase in the love we have for each other. Many of us concentrate on a few differences we may have. And as a result, we've split the ummah into the smallest piece. We want to do the opposite. We want to bring the ummah together. And we want to try our best to love each other in a way that this ummah can benefit once again from its numbers and from our togetherness.